chose this month and this 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 week and this you know the the uh, the week of the uh, the winter solstice is all as a as a focus of the birth of Christ because light coming into the the darkest of times. So now I've given you another uh, Jeopardy answer. Hopefully you'll go on the day whenever the topic is Advent, and then you can say what is the winter solstice. There's a lot of symbolism that's attached to Advent. All kinds of symbolism from the winter solstice to, to all, all kinds of things. But the nativity really is, is at the center of it all. And in it, it represents God stepping through the doorway of heaven and earth and coming as the Christ child, as Emmanuel. And, and we've, we've done our readings on that. We've had our, our, we're having our focus of that this month. But the last week when we focused on the fullness of God in the flesh... This is where we are getting the understanding of what Christ, not just symbolically represents, but who he is and what he brings with him. So today we're going to be talking about the gifts that Jesus offers. What is it that Jesus offers us? We've been in this Christmas 101 series, um, getting back to the basics, you know, uh, why he came, uh, who he is, what is it that Jesus offers. And there's, a, like I said, a ton of emphasis given to the symbols, but uh, we, we, uh, one of the, the things that we recognize with, uh, with Christmas is gift giving. Why do we give gifts? And it's because of the gift that God gave us in Christ. Uh, now, we've been studying Colossians chapter 1 and chapter 2 during, this, during these sessions. We're going to be back in Colossians chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 19, and we're going to look at the gifts that Christ gives today. Starting at verse 19... It reads, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held, laid out by the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So today we're going to look at a couple of the, the gifts that Christ offers. And the first one is reconciliation. Reconciliation with God is one of the big gifts that we recognize coming because Christ came. And usually when we talk, use this word reconciliation, it's, we usually use it in terms of a breakup. Uh, whenever there has been a breakup or a disagreement or a split up between, a split between two people. Um, maybe in marriage, maybe between friends. There's been an argument, there's been a disagreement. One has offended the other. There's been a breakup. And reconciliation is the process of those two coming back together again. Romance movies, chick flicks, lifetime movies are all about that breakup and that reconciliation. You've seen The Parent Trap. Parent Trap is about that. If you watch Grey's Anatomy, how many times can they write in that series over 10 years the breakup and the coming back together? Boy meets girl, fall in love. Boy says something stupid. Girl breaks up with boy. Boy comes to his senses. Girl forgives boy. And they fall in love again. Wash, rinse, and repeat. Each and every movie, each and every story, the breakup, the reconciliation, the two coming back together again. And that's the story of the gospel. That's the story of God coming to us. Verse 21 says this. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies. That's what verse 21 says. We were alienated. We were separated from God. We were enemies with God. But then verse 22 says, but. And I love the buts in scriptures. The but nows and the but gods. Wonderful words. That's what he says. And, and, and but God. 
Romans 5 says this. You see, at just the right time when they were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely would anyone die for a righteous person, but though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But God. Ephesians 2 says, Remember at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you, were, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The but gods and the but nows in Scripture. Beautiful verses to remind ourselves that we are part of a greater love story. That we are part of one that transcends time. One where we're being pursued. We sang about it this morning in the, in, in it's, and we recognize in the scripture that the, that the Bible does call us the bride of Christ. That we're the bride and that he's the bridegroom. That, that we recognize that, that we are coming together. We are being wed together in God by Christ. Verse 22 says, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So not only does, is the gift reconciliation, but the gift is also that we have a freedom from accusation. Freedom from accusation. And I think the best description I could come up to, uh, to describe this is what it's like for those sitting on death row. Those sitting on death row, they've been convicted of a crime. They've been found guilty, and their verdict is death. That's going to be the penalty. Their verdict is death. And then once that happens, all that the convict has left to hope for is that the governor of the state issues what? A pardon. Issues a pardon. So they, they hope for that. They appeal for that pardon. They, the, you know, the, the lawyers on behalf of, they, they, they call on the governor to consider pardoning him. But unless the governor steps in, that inmate's doom is sure. Well, the Bible tells us that the verdict is in regarding each of us, and we stand on death row. The judge has handed down his verdict because we have, as the Bible says, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We all stand accused. And the only way to escape that punishment is to be granted a pardon. And so Christ coming as Emmanuel, Christ entering into our world, our plane, allows us to have a means of receiving that pardon. That's the good news of Advent, of Christmas. That we don't have to sit on pins and needles hoping that someone will grant us pardon. We know that we can receive pardon. So verse 21 says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies, but now he has reconciled you. Now we, what was separated, what did alienate us from God, he has now given us a means to make right. And it comes by the pardon that he offers in Jesus Christ. No matter what who we are, what we've done, no matter how far we've slipped, we can receive that pardon because Jesus stands in our place. He took on flesh so that he could stand in our place because God demanded a sacrifice. Advent reminds us that the sacrifice has been given that the means of pardoning have been provided. So he took on flesh so that he can then stand in our place and take on the penalty that we deserved on ourselves. When scripture says that the weight of our sin was upon him, that's what Jesus took on. He took the weight and burden of our sin and he placed it on his sinful body. In chapter 2, Starting in verse 6, Paul writes, So then just as you received Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. 
For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, which is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised in him through your faithful faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. There's a phrase that Paul puts in here that I think that is so very appropriate to Advent, to Christmas, to this month. And so it starts in verse 8 where he says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Uh, one of the main purposes of Advent is to, during this season, put our attention wholly on Christ because there is so much to distract us from Jesus during the month of December. And I love all of those things. I, I grew up loving them. I, 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 I love doing them as a daddy, as a father. It, it, all of those other traditions and that's attached to Christmas are so much fun. But we, we ought to be aware when we allow those traditions to prevent us from talking about Jesus and to focusing on Jesus during this time. In our gatherings with our family, in our gathering with our friends, in our time when we have our Christmas parties and the like. Because there is a, 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 a very deep gift, an important gift that I want to move into next that this passage of Scripture um, focuses on and that is our identity in Christ our identity in Christ Paul teaches that, the, that in this doctrine that Christ is the fullness of God which is which has been part of our discussion the last couple of weeks but it's within this doctrine that we understand how God sees us as we are committed to Christ this is what he says in verse 9 for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form and then verse 10 and you have been given the fullness in Christ. So the, the fullness of God that is in Jesus Christ is now the fullness of God that is in those who believe and who profess Jesus as Lord. That's what's in play because of Advent. And Paul spells it out for us that now it is possible for the fullness of God to now live within us. Jesus even said it very clearly when he said, Now I am going so that the Counselor can come. So that the Holy Spirit can now fill the hearts of those who believe. And we recognize that it is by way of the birth of Christ that that fullness is possible. Without the coming of Christ, the other would not be possible. God's fullness in Jesus, the moment of his earthly birth, and his death, burial, and resurrection is the fullness that now lives within each and every one of us. And we can become living vessels by which God lives in and works through. Again, look at verse 9. It says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ. So we never have to doubt, you know, God, are you with me? If you've professed Christ, yes, God is with you. You never have to ask the question, God, where were you whenever I was going through this? The answer is, I was right there with you the entire time. There is never a moment where we have to doubt or to fear that we are going through whatever it is that you're going through personally without God. If you've proclaimed Christ as Lord and Savior in your life, you know that God is right there with you. And when God is right there with you, there is nothing that he won't see you through or strengthen you through or give you the faith to make it through or help you overcome. There is nothing in this world that can overpower the hand of God. And because of Advent's coming, because of Christ coming in the flesh, he made it possible for God to now dwell then in our flesh. Verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. How is that possible? Because in the flesh, 
that is what Jesus made happen. It was taking on flesh. It's God coming as Emmanuel and taking on flesh that he made it possible then for us to receive God in our flesh. Once you were dead in your sins. How is it that we were dead? I see several people walking around in this world, right? Peter talks about it in his first letter. In 1 Peter, he talks about dead men walking, that we are a bunch of dead men walking around. What truly makes one alive? The joy that we recognize in Christ's coming is that I am no longer dead. If you want to know what God offers you through Advent, it's not simply the forgiveness of sin. As if that's simple. That's really not simple, is it? It's not just simply the reconciliation and justification. That's not simple either. But the thought, the understanding, the possibility that God now dwells in me. I mean, I don't have to go to find God. That God is, is, is right here. I don't have to, I don't have to doubt or, 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 or hope or say, God, I, I, I need you to come and meet me. No, he's right there already. Open your eyes to what he has provided. He's provided himself. So here it is. Here's the greatest gift. Emmanuel's coming means God can live in you. God can live in you. He's with every one of us who's ever taken on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as our own. He's there. Our personal profession of faith isn't that we hopefully wish that we will be saved one day. No, you're saved then and there, and God makes his dwelling within you, and you never have to fear or doubt whether or not that will ever take hold. It has taken hold. It is true, it is present, it is evident. The great reward that God gives us in Christ is his presence. And one of the things that, one of the themes, excuse me, one of the themes that I see throughout the scripture, especially with the, the tabernacle and, and, you know, with the, the you know, all of that, you know, you know, that they had to have these places within scripture, within the temple and all that, that had to be uh, uh, cleansed or, or, you know, whoever went in there to, to perform whatever offerings. They, they had to go through all of these, these rituals and, 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 uh, and, and things to clean themselves and all these special sort of cleansing, cleansing rituals in order to make it into the holy place in the temple in order to, to put the, the sacrifice on the altar and, and no one else could go in there because they weren't worthy enough. When that veil tore in two... The moment of Christ's death on the cross. That was done away with. Because Jesus made it possible then for us to be the holy of holies that God will dwell in. I think that, that we, we, we sometimes fail to recognize what Jesus made possible. For if he could then take on flesh, we are the flesh that God can take on too and live in us. See, the, the imagery of the nativity, the, 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 the symbolic imagery of the, of the nativity is, is much more than just a baby in a manger and everyone ooh and an on ah around that baby being born. God now lives in the flesh. That opens up a doorway in understanding how now God relates to you and to me. What is the joy? What is it that this day represents? With the coming of Christ in the flesh? You have direct access with God. You can be a house that God lives in. You and now can now you can now relate to God 
in a way that was never possible before. It had to be through all these rituals. It had to be through all these sacrifices. It had to be through all of these, this religious stuff. Now it comes by claiming Jesus' death on the cross as your own and Jesus' resurrection in life as your own and in recognizing that God can now live in your life as his own. So wherever we are and whatever we're going through, whatever the struggle, whatever our hang-ups, however weak we feel, God is right there. And with God, all things are possible. Emmanuel in his finest is present. Advent's hope, peace, love, joy are realized, can be realized. When we accept Advent's gift, reconciliation, freedom from accusation, and God in the flesh. Pray with me. Father, in this morning, we've taken time to acknowledge in so many different fashions, through prayer, through song, through scripture, through your spoken word, the magnificence of Advent, of your coming. And all that you've made possible by taking on flesh, that now we can be a vessel that you live in, that you are living in, that you can speak through, that you can work through. Lord, how humbling, how humbling that is if we would just realize how you have reconciled us to yourself.